Okay, sounds great. Um, <clears throat> let me do some opening welcoming comments. Um, Alan Larson, I'm the president and CEO of Soap Health. Joining me on this call is Spencer Thomas, our CEO on the Martinsville campus, as well as Dr. Sharan Degun Nolan, who is the Chief Medical Officer for Sova Health. Um, appreciate your interest in meeting. Um, we've announced today, as we've learned, others in the state of Virginia have also announced that we will need to curtail for a period of about two weeks uh, elective procedures that are performed at each of our two campuses in response to a recent surge uh, in the COVID. Um, unfortunately, we've been here before, or maybe fortunately, we've been here before. Um, we have experience on these surges and our responses um, seem to be effective in helping us manage our, our resources. Um, and, and I'll let uh, Dr. Gunn Nolan talk a little bit more about the specific um, statistics. And I know several have asked specific questions, but um, we, we're disappointed that we have to make this response. We feel that our responsibility as a hospital is to provide care for all of our patients. Um, but unfortunately, in order to take care of a few that are spiking and have increased need, primarily those with COVID, we are required to reduce our services for those who are um, elective and not urgent. Um, I think it's important to understand that we are still capable of taking care of urgent and emergent cases, both um, those for cardiac, heart attacks, strokes, we are still taking care of those. But for our elective procedures, surgical, surgical and others, we are um, putting on pause for a couple of weeks, looking at the spikes and the trends. Uh, we feel like that a two week period of time should help us catch up. Um, and then we can we can resume normal operations. We hope that that's the case. Um, so Spencer, let me let you share some thoughts um, specific to um, Martinsville or any other general comments, and then we'll let Dr. Gunn Nolan share some thoughts and then open it up to some questions. Uh, thank you, Alan. I, I, only thing that I would add is that uh, you know, uh, uh, for speaking for the Martinsville uh, campus, we're we're disappointed to find ourselves in this situation again. Uh, it's actually been probably more than a year since we've had to do this on the Martinsville campus, uh, but we feel like it's the right and appropriate thing to do to make sure that we have the resources to take care of our patients. Sir, I'll just jump right in and say, uh, you know, the big question that we get is where do we stand right now with COVID? I've talked to many of you throughout this week. Earlier, we were reporting just under 50 patients across the market. And honestly, we're just under 60 at this point, 80% of those still being unvaccinated. As Alan has mentioned, you know, we, we are making these changes so that we can continue to care for our communities. Um, it's not too late to get a vaccine. It's never too late to get a vaccine. And, and we just want to Make sure that those foundational principles, you know, wear a mask, good hand hygiene, social distancing, they still matter. So Haley, how do we want to handle questions? I know there were some that were sent in ahead of time, but there may be others. Do you want to, you want to raise your hand, um, Haley, and you can call on individuals that might have questions. We appreciate your willingness to join this on a short notice. We feel like this is important to, to make the community aware. So Haley, do you want to coordinate the Q&A session, please? Sure. Um, we can use the chat or just throw up your hand or an emoji and um, we'll just start in order. Haley, is it easier if I go ahead and cover the questions that were sent in? Yes, that's perfectly fine as well. So I do believe the first question was, what I've just stated, where do we stand right now with COVID? Um, that, again, that's just under 60 split fairly evenly across both campuses. Um, the next question was about patients coming in to our ER as a testing site. I wanna remind the general public that our emergency rooms are to be preserved for emergency situations. If you are experiencing an emergency, please do not hesitate, but come and seek care in an emergency facility. Otherwise, patients are triaged based on that emergency need. So you would undergo that triage assessment. And if you are not deemed an emergency, those emergencies would be 
put ahead of you in regards to your evaluation and management. The misconception is that patients can come to the hospital to get a quick answer whether or not they have COVID. I know COVID-19 testing is not necessarily an easy thing to find these days within a community, but our commercial pharmacies, local health departments do have options. And I would ask that everyone seek those options before coming to the hospital just to try to get a COVID test. Our COVID-19 tests that are used for non-emergency cases are send out. So it will take two to three days for results and people need to be prepared for that. This is not a rapid, quick turnaround. We reserve those tests for those emergency situations and patients when we need to know. Um, the next question I think that was asked was, are we seeing quarantine of staff? And I think every job market these days is seeing quarantine of staff. It's important to note that you know, we encourage our staff, no matter what their occupation job position they serve in the hospital, we want them to be safe both when they're in the hospital and outside of the hospital. We know that those factors influence a lot. We have policies and protocols to protect them here, but you go grocery shopping or, or to any of the other retail markets or even out to eat and you can be putting yourself at risk if not done so safely. So we have seen staff quarantine. I don't have a particular number um, at this time, but I want to be clear that that's not just bedside clinical staff. That's that's all health staff. You know, COVID doesn't care what your occupation is. It can affect anybody. The next question was, why is this COVID surge different? Um, I would like to say that they were all the same, but they've all been quite different. We saw with the Delta variant, it was a lot deadlier and patients progressed rather quickly to the ICU. Unfortunately, Omicron has a slight predisposition to infect those that have previously had COVID-19. And as you can imagine, your first go around with COVID-19 is, is quite serious. So to do that again is, is a lot for the body to overcome. Unfortunately, um, to be honest, I'm seeing less of those unvaccinated patients make it back home. And that's disheartening with a variant that's really seems to spread a lot easier, but not necessarily as severe, like a variant is Delta causing such significant illness, but it just seems to be too much for the body to overcome at this time. That's a sad phrase to say because we have a way to fix that. Uh, vaccinations help decrease your risk of death, help decrease your risk of progression to severe illness. We do have patients that are being hospitalized that have been vaccinated. Those patients are going home. They drastically decrease their risk of death by just getting that vaccine and, and getting it once you're diagnosed with COVID is too late. The next question is how do we manage our COVID-19 patients? Do we have a dedicated floor? or a dedicated area for COVID-19. We have dedicated rooms that are managed to be a negative pressure room for those COVID-19 patients. Staff are trained with donning and doffing appropriate PPE, including a fit tested N95 mask or higher, as well as an isolation gown, gloves, face shield, and eyewear. There's a very particular way that those staff, um, no matter what the reason for going in the room, um, they all follow that same process, and that's to decrease the risk of spread even in our own facility. And that's on top of our universal masking protocol that all staff follows when on campus. Last but not least, uh, business as usual was the question, why do we look around and not see people in masks? And it just seems to be business as usual. Um, <laughs> Guys, this is day 661 of a global pandemic, and I, more than anyone, would love for this to be business as usual, but we're not there yet, and to act like it is, is a deadly mistake. Um, the decision to go out in public or to be around others with unknown vaccination status especially is not a decision you're making for yourself. That does, that's a decision that you're making that puts your neighbor at risk, that puts those that you're standing beside at risk. Your decision to wear a mask protects those around you. Your decision to not wear a mask puts those around you at risk. I just wanna be really clear that we, we understand, I get it, it's your body, your right, but your decision not to mask when you're in public is putting everyone around you at risk. That's concerning. I mean, we're in yet another surge and, and to be quite frank, these will continue unless changes are made. I can't encourage the public enough to, you know, it's not too late to get vaccinated. Vaccines are free, they're readily available. 
you want the alarm system on the house before the burglar gets in, not after the fact. So we encourage everyone to get vaccinated now if you have not already. Wear your mask, good hand hygiene and social distancing. I think we've said this for 661 days now that we know that that's the protocol that works. And, and we encourage our communities to also fall in suit. This is, everyone's tired, everyone's exhausted, everyone wants this to end but it won't if we don't change the pattern. Thanks, Dr. Gundolin. Are there other questions? I think Thomas, your question that you put in the chat was answered in Sharanda's list. Do we have others who would like to ask a question? Please. We did. Yes, we have Daniel Cruz. He would like to ask a question. Okay, Daniel, go ahead. Daniel, you may be on mute. I am on mute. It, that helps if I click that button, doesn't it? That's um, the most common phrase of 2021. <laughs> you are on mute. It, it is, without a doubt. Um, thank you again for, for setting some time aside for us today. Um, quick question looking forward if we were to pull out a crystal ball. I know a lot of hospital systems are expecting to obviously continue seeing these patients with COVID continue to come in. I think in Greensboro, they were expecting to see 300 patients by the end of the week. Looking at the next several weeks, where do you guys see these patient numbers getting up to? It's hard to predict exactly where it's going to go. It seems like even the best predictors um, for betting on games and chance are uh, also not very effective. Um, there are a lot of organizations that spend a lot of time Johns Hopkins uh, UVA. Um, we had looked at those numbers, um, Brian and, and sorry, Daniel, and felt that um, by the 24th, we should see this surge um, declining. So our current hold on non um, essential procedures will be for two weeks. So I guess we're hoping that that trend will um, hold true that we've seen for others. The number this will get up to, I think would be difficult to be able to predict, but uh, we're anticipating we'll evaluate again on the Monday the 17th to make sure that the um, trend is going the way we hope it will and the way we think it will. But uh, we, we anticipate um, an evaluation of that a week from Monday. Does that answer your question, sir? It did, thank you very much. Thank you. I wish we could be more specific. If we knew how to predict, we would be in a better spot. And Daniel, a lot of those predictions go into um, based on the holidays, and we know that it takes a, about that two-week time period before we start to see that ripple effect as everyone has gone back home to be with their families and return to work. So um, those kind of where that pattern follows and, and where that information stems from. We'll ask a question, Sharanda, about how effective the vaccine is against the Omicron variant. So studies continue to vary um, with that information. I don't have a specific, uh, to be honest, it continues to decrease your risk of death. Um, the other day for our press conference on Wednesday, the risk of death for the state of Virginia for Virginians who were fully vaccinated and boosted was 0.01% risk of death. Um, those that are unvaccinated, um, their risk of contracting COVID-19 is 4.4 times higher than those that are vaccinated. Um, for me, those statistics speak volumes. Um, we know that those that are vaccinated do better than others. We continue to see more and more research come out. This vaccine is better than that one and, and so on. And it gets a lot of muddy water that really honestly doesn't matter which one has a hair better than the other. All of them decrease your risk of death. I don't want that to be clear every single vaccine that is readily available decreases your risk of death. The CDC reported nine out of 10 deaths are prevented with a vaccine. Death does not occur in just your elderly population. I have 20, 30, 4 year olds who have not survived their fight against COVID-19. And that continues to be the trend that COVID doesn't care. It doesn't care if you're Democrat, Republican, who you worship, it doesn't care. So the vaccine, I mean, if, if saving a life isn't enough, I don't know what else is. So I, I just can't stress that enough. 
um, with all these other research, everybody wants to be the one to have the defining this vaccine works better. And so there's lots of small studies going on, but I don't think we'll ever have a, a definitive answer until there's yet another variant and we're asking the same question. Maybe putting a finer point on that, Bill, there is the chance that even though I've been vaccinated, I can get the I can get COVID. There, there, the people who are getting COVID have been vaccinated. The, the difference is, is that their, their um, disease is significantly less intense um, and um, not hospitalized and definitely reduction in the possibility of death. Thank you. Other questions? I saw Will's hand go up first, so I'll call on Will. Hi, y'all. Uh, just wanted to, to check in. Um, you know, we've heard the word disappointed. We can tell you guys are, are frustrated. Can you talk to me of kind of what the morale is, um, you know, across both campuses at this point, having to return to something that um, I heard was over a year ago since you guys have had to do this again? So you can talk to me just about, you know, morale at the hospitals. You know, I'll, I'll go first and then I'll let Spencer add some comments from, from his campus. Um, Part of what makes a, uh, an, um, a person want to work in a hospital is because they have a unique um, passion for compassion. And I would say that uh, by and large, um, we, um, we, we are still here taking care of patients, but it is causing a toll, Will. I, I won't be uh, dishonest in saying we're all fine, we're just moving forward. Um, it, it is frustrating. There are Many providers. We've been spending a lot of time over the last six months, maybe longer, around resilience and how to help people cope with things that can be very frustrating. So we would we would appreciate um, some help from the community so that we can do our jobs better and not having to continue to focus on taking care of COVID patients. But we're here. Uh, we're still showing up and uh, doing our part. An interesting um, report that uh, I heard recently, uh, over 500,000 healthcare workers across the country have left the healthcare field um, for frustration. So that's nationally since February to September of last year. So I think that number should indicate that there are quite a few people that uh, would say that their resilience is low. Spencer, how would you describe it? I would agree. I mean, I think um, when we say disappointed, when we use words like that, I think what we're really thinking about is that, uh, to Dr. Gunn Nolan's point, we, you know, much of this is preventable, uh, either through vaccination or by or by taking uh, some simple public health measures like masking and and making sure that we're uh, avoiding um, um, large groups, those sorts of things. But I think from a staffing standpoint, I I've been humbled by our team, uh, just in all honesty. Um, they continue to face this day in and day out. Uh, although this is a, a difficult surge, and I think probably the worst that we've seen, or at least I've seen over the over the last two years, um, you know, no one hesitates to jump in when when needed. So uh, one of the reasons why we uh, uh, look to uh, put a pause on our elective cases is because we can we can ask those folks or have those folks help in other areas of the hospital. And we've been doing that for the last couple of days on the Martinsville campus. And uh, again, I'm just uh, I'm humbled to see a group of people that are just willing to say, tell me what it is that 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 you need and we'll figure out a way to get it done. And and that's been the spirit of our team uh, so far. Thomas, your question. Yes, th thank you. Uh, with this elective pause, uh, do we know how many patients are going to be affected? And also, if there's a two-week pause, uh, in those cases back up, are they looking at potentially longer than two-week delay? Uh, and, or is it just on a case-by-case -case basis? It's, uh, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and I don't know that we know the exact number, Thomas, to be able to say, but what we've done before, we, we have been here, where we've put a pause. All of the patients that had to be delayed were rescheduled once the cases were resumed. So I think at this point, I don't anticipate um, these patients to be um, restricted in being able to receive care. Um, we learned from a call earlier today that many other facilities in the state of Virginia are doing the same thing. So that um, 
we're finding that uh, this is a common response for many hospitals. Um, and we, we feel confident that those patients can be taken care of once we resume. As I mentioned before, we expect to resume on the 24th of January. So two week pause. Um, if the trend goes the way we predict, it could be longer, but we hope that it won't be. Other questions? If you have questions as you uh, report back to your editors or staff, um, please feel free to reach out to Haley. Haley will do her best to try to get any additional questions answered that you didn't get a chance to ask on this call. Um, we value our partnership with you in the media and thank you for sending this message um, to your um, readers and listeners. It's, uh, it's really important for us to be able to talk with you openly about our current situation. And uh, as always, if you have other questions, don't hesitate to reach out to, uh, to us. Haley, back to you for any final. Just want to say thank you all for joining. Um, thank you all for being so responsive and supportive of us. Um, if you have, like Alan said, any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you all.